biological weapon developed for the military is now in use on Main Street, and it can zero in on our most personal communications. This technology is so invasive. It doesn't just collect information about one person, it collects information about tens of thousands of people. The technology would have remained secret if not for this man, a criminal living underground using multiple identities. His revelation sparks a fierce debate. Our founding fathers would be sickened if they found out how far we'd slip. How did this criminal turned activist become the first person to reveal the technology called the Stingray? And why does the government want to keep it a secret?
After a second sting was also unsuccessful, the pressure to solve the case was enormous. After four months of investigative work, law enforcement narrowed their search to an apartment complex in Santa Clara, California. They were doing surveillance on the apartment, and they had been doing that for like 18 days. So finally, one of the agents spotted somebody meeting the description of who they thought I was. They all jump on me, and they're pounding on me, and they think I'm armed, and I was all bruised up and cut up. And in fact, my hands were so scraped up, they couldn't even fingerprint me for like three days. Fingerprints revealed the hacker's real name, Daniel Rigney. As it was happening, I knew what it was. You know, I knew that uh, they tracked down the air cart. It was kind of like a cell phone, but without calling features. Just plugs into a computer, and you can go on the internet through cell towers. I didn't know exactly how they did it, but I knew that they had tracked the location of that air cart, and that's how I was getting arrested right then at that moment. Daniel Rigman knew there was something fishy about how they found him. And he looks at all the documents, and they don't really explain it. So he starts litigating it and asking for more discovery and more information to figure out exactly what they did. How did they find him? Serving as his own lawyer, Rig Maiden begins to believe he was caught in an illegal search using a covert tracking technology originally developed for military use. I had, like, file boxes full of paperwork. It was probably at least, you know, 20,000 pages of discovery. I couldn't do keyword searches. I had to basically go through page by page by page. He writes a complex series of letters to technology and civil liberties expert, Chris Segoyan. When you represent yourself, that's like a pretty strong signal that you're crazy. And then when you're filing, like, handwritten pro se motions, that's putting you into an additional level of, like, paranoid, not crazy scrutiny. You have this guy claiming that the government used a secret surveillance technology to send signals through the wall of his house to track him. I mean, this is straight up like paranoid conspiracy theory stuff. No one, you know, took him seriously. But then they also had these hand-drawn emergency motions, handwritten in like pen or crayon, that looked crazy. All the experts, they were convinced he was nuts. But something caught my eye, and I started skimming the brief. And, you know, I think... Two minutes in, I had an oh shit moment, and I knew that he had the goods. I am Paul Jose Sabagina, the house manager. Says that we must get out now, that soon it will be very bad. We have been abandoned. Daniel Rigmaiden was in jail for tax fraud. But while there, he discovered he was captured using a potentially illegal technology. Went through almost all the evidence, and in one of the last boxes, it had reports in there from a postal inspector who was on the case, and he had mentioned in one of his reports, we tracked the air car down to a certain area, and the FBI is using a stingray to pinpoint the location of the air car. And that's when I knew, okay, well, that's the device, it's a stingray. You know, like a bulldog, he just like grabbed it and then refused to let go. He then went on this uh, this research rampage. But he looked up everything he could find about this technology and how it worked, and painted this picture for the court. Using patent searches conducted from his jail library, Rigmaiden was able to uncover an image of the device used to track him. The world was about to get its first glimpse of the stingray. A stingray is a device that basically impersonates a cell phone tower and it sends out a signal that tells your phone to connect to it just like a regular cell phone tower does but instead of then routing your call which is what a cell phone tower would do it collects information from your phone the strength of its signal it can collect unique identifying numbers on the hardware it can even collect the calls that you're making if you're talking on the phone at the time and it routes that information to the FBI or to whatever police department is using it. And the purpose of it is to use your phone as a tracking device without having to go through the phone company. This technology is so invasive. It doesn't just collect information about one person. They unnecessarily collect information about large numbers of innocent people. There's no way to use a stingray like a scalpel. It's like a, a huge trawler net that collects information about every phone in the neighborhood. The rules governing its use are both not clear 
not highly developed in the courts yet, and not at all transparent. Rigmaiden understood that his freedom hinged on whether the government's use of Stingray was legal or a Fourth Amendment violation. The Fourth Amendment was adopted largely as a revulsion against um, the uh, pre-independence practice of the British of engaging what are called general searches, searching anywhere and everywhere for violations of the customs laws. The framers of this constitution adopted the Fourth Amendment and required the government to specify with particularity the places and persons to be searched and only authorized searches based on probable cause and did not authorize what are called general searches. The moment the police send that penetrating signal into your living room, into your bedroom, into your purse or pocketbook, into your car, that they've intruded upon private space. We take our phones with us to private places. You know, most people now use a cell phone as their alarm clock. It's sitting at your bedside table. People take their cell phones into the bathroom. These devices come with us and are witness to some of our most private and intimate moments. I think many Americans would say that the government has no business entering their home if they've done nothing wrong. This is fundamentally a technology that scoops up information about mostly innocent people to find that one bad needle in the haystack. And, you know, I don't want to be part of that haystack. Taking what he'd learned about the stingray, Rigmaiden went to court to try to get the evidence against him dismissed. Mr. Rigmaiden brought what's called a motion to suppress under the Fourth Amendment, saying that evidence was unlawfully obtained in his case and the government should not be permitted to use it in his criminal prosecution. So there's Daniel Rigmaiden in his um, orange jumpsuit and me on one side of the courtroom. And then on the other side, there is an army of people in suits. By revealing use of potentially illegal Stingray technology, Daniel Rigmaiden was pressuring the government to drop its case against him. So Rigmaiden's case was a real David and Goliath story. So there's Daniel Rigmaiden in his um, orange jumpsuit and me on one side of the courtroom. On the government side, they had the three prosecutors that were appointed to the case. Plus they had an attorney from FBI headquarters. Plus they had a number of other people in suits ready to go. I don't know who they were or why they were there, but they were pretty serious. The judge basically proceeded to cross-examine the existing United States attorney in a way that I've really never seen before. At issue was whether the Stingray had violated the rights of innocent people caught in its dragnet surveillance. One of the problems with the Stingray technology is that when the police or anybody else are using it to gather information about communications about one individual who is, as you say, a suspect, um, they are also at least potentially gathering similar information from dozens or even hundreds of people who happen to be in the proximity of the device that they're using. The judge, in the dark about Stingray technology, was concerned about its bulk collection of innocent third-party information. The judge asked the AUSA what was effectively a rhetorical question. Um, counsel, do you think Judge Seaboard would have wanted to know that an MC catcher picks up third-party information? Which was then followed by a very long and awkward pause. And then the AUSA eventually returning to the microphone and simply saying, yes, Your Honor. In open court, Daniel Rigmaiden had forced the secret surveillance technology into the light of day and had unknowingly ignited a heated debate about its use. Rick Smith is a former FBI agent who agreed to go on the record defending the Stingray. You have to look at the big picture. There's terrorism, there's criminal acts and there's enterprise out there. And if you can acquire the information necessary to identify where somebody is, you want to use it. Technology is able to pinpoint where people are. That's a tremendous achievement to have when you're talking about terrorism or criminal acts or finding missing people. But judges across the United States are beginning to suspect they aren't being told the whole story. Many are echoing concerns over the tracking of innocent people's cell phones, asking, where should we draw the line? We've been calling it the magistrate's revolt. They're not just going to sit there and believe what the DOJ tells them anymore because they've been burned. They've been burned with cell tracking. They've been burned with 
warrant, so magistrates are beginning to realize that these novel technologies are being used in novel ways with strange legal interpretations that are not all that clear to them. Ronald Culpepper is one of those judges. He recently presided over a different case involving Stingray technology in Pierce County Superior Court in Tacoma, Washington. Well, I don't really have much appreciation or sympathy for identity thieves. On the other hand, all of us are protected by the Constitution, and the police have to act within it. They've gotten warrants, but the warrants haven't told us how they're using them, and so we were pretty concerned about that. Uh, I was presiding judge at the time, contacted all the other judges to see whether they'd heard anything about this. Nobody had. In 2015, the Associated Press reported that the FBI is regularly flying spy planes over American cities fitted with Stingray technology. The planes carry the markings of fake front companies actually controlled by the FBI. I don't look at the secrecy the way some people do. It's just some things need to be kept secret. If you're talking about Stingray technology as yeah, something that, that, at one time anyway, was an advance and didn't want to be revealed because the other side could take measures to uh, circumvent it. I want to give law enforcement every tool they, they can as long as they use it consistent with the Constitution. But what we're seeing is that as technology grows, new tools are given to law enforcement, and law enforcement seems to forget that they've you know, taken the oath to uphold the Constitution. And this whole idea that we have to protect the technology, great. Who's going to protect us from you? Daniel Rigmaiden was the first to reveal law enforcement use of the Stingray. It was something the government had never conceded in any criminal case that I or other <laughs> attorneys who follow these issues are aware of. But even with the admission that a Stingray was used, the judge refused to dismiss the case. Rigmaiden was facing up to 20 years in prison when he got some stunning news. I get a letter from the lead prosecutor. He says, we don't want to deal with you anymore. How about we just take time served? You know, you can just be guilty to a few felonies. You can get out within a couple of months. Everyone was shocked. You know, the crime he was accused of was a crime, a serious financial crime. A guy with a stellar defense team would have had a tough time getting that kind of deal. Preserving this technology, the facade of secrecy, I think was more important to the FBI than keeping Rigman behind bars for another 20 years. In April 2014, Daniel Rigmaiden walked out of prison a free man. When I got out of prison, it felt like I was stepping out of a time machine. So I got in in 2008, and then I stepped out in 2014. I noticed that there were a lot of people on their smartphones, like, everywhere, all the time. It was like, no matter where they were, what they were doing, they were always had their, just like what I'm doing now with my phone now, they're just, like, looking down at their phone. It kind of drives it home how important it was, you know, because if everybody's using their phones all the time and they're using these devices to, to track people, then it's, it's pretty important that they follow the Constitution. Ripples of Rig Maiden's case have grown into an avalanche of resistance, with everyone from state senators to county supervisors across the nation recoiling at the secrecy and possible constitutional threat surrounding Stingray use. This flies in the face of every concept of liberty and privacy that we cherish in this country. Our founding fathers would be sickened if they found out how far we'd slipped. Law enforcement has been put on the defensive, often hostile to local reporters' attempts to get more information. Dealt with your incessant badgering of our department over this these is issues. This a privacy issue. Reporters have directly challenged FBI Director James Comey. This is not about the content of people's communications or collecting every number that they dial. Right? To me, it's about we are using some equipment, appropriately in my view, to find bad guys. But activists are skeptical, and some have even created their own technology to detect Stingray use. It's technology versus technology. That's what it's about. Hi, I was calling about uh, the place for rent. Okay, well, I mean, if I wanted to still do it, would you be, would you be open to it, or is, is a kind of a deal breaker while the battle rages on, Rick Maiden is adjusting to post-prison life. Well, it's definitely difficult being a felon in society. It's almost impossible to find a place to live. This is a place? This All right. Home. This place isn't much bigger of a cell that I was in. But at the same time, there was three of us in there. This could use a good cleaning, that's for sure. Easiest movement in history. 
everyone was convinced that he will go forward and can be a productive member of society. He's clearly very, very brilliant. His experience with the criminal justice system has set him on a very different path. He's now set up a website and he's really interested in open government issues and uh, he continues to litigate Freedom of Information Act cases. He's an amazing privacy and civil rights advocate at this point. It has been proven that 13 federal agencies, including the IRS and the FBI, have been using Stingray-like devices. In 2015, Washington State passed new legislation that would force law enforcement to get a warrant before using a Stingray. It was written, in part, by Daniel Rigney. The Daniel Rigney case brought the cell tower simulator issue to the forefront. I think the American public is going to demand action not only by Congress but the states. We have an opportunity now because people for the first time in a long time really are beginning to understand how massive surveillance is, how powerful these technologies are, and the abuses that our government is capable of when it operates in secret. And, you know, we need to ask ourselves, like, what kind of society do we want to be? Everyone deserves a second chance, maybe not a third chance, but at least a second chance. I kind of see this as my second chance, so I'm trying to do the best that I can to kind of make a difference and, and leverage what started off as a bad situation to try to make it into something good. Yeah, the fight continues.